Let's talk about weakness. Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel. My name is Brittany Simon. In today's video, we're gonna talk about weakness and specifically the form of weakness that I think is the most deplorable or even disgusting. Remember that I'm not trying to cast judgment. I'm not trying to condemn you. I'm trying to give you a tool to self-reflect just in case you find yourself in a trap or in a loop where you notice that you're acting on the bad kind of weakness to help you kind of get out of it. Again, we're always trying to self-improve. We're not trying to condemn. So my focus on today's podcast is to remind people that all of us are human, all of us are flawed, and some of us do give in to temptation, but I think there's a way out. So before we jump into that, we are drinking organic red clover tea. This is a product of Italy and... Mm. Delicious as always. Okay, so what made me want to talk about forms of weakness? <laughs> to be honest with you, it was that comment I got that I told you guys about that I said, you know, it's important to learn what values you're willing to die for. And somebody in the comment section was like, die for your values. Who does that? Lots of people do that. But maybe it's just my Catholic background where saints told stories. There was parables in the Bible. There were all the all this lore around values and dying for your values, dying for Christ. That the idea that some of you are being raised in bubbles where that's not happening is so perplexing to me. Because then I have to ask you, how do you know what's right and wrong? How do you know why you don't do certain things? How do you know what's evil? How do you, what do you use as your sort of checklist? You know, how do you reflect on situations? For me, I default to my values and my values have to stay strong even when it's hard. The failings of friends, colleagues, and partners can be deeply galling. We got close to them because of their skills and merits, but after a while, it can be the disappointing sides of their personalities that dominate our view of them. We look upon their faults and wonder again and again why they are the way they are. Why so slow? Why so unreliable? How can they be so bad at explaining things or telling an anecdote? Why can't they face bad news straight on? Even worse, we feel they could change if only they really wanted to. If only they weren't so mean. Consider the following sentences. Jeff ate Chinese even though it was more expensive than curry. Okay. Jeff ate dessert even though it was more unhealthy than doing without. Okay, Jeff didn't pay the bill even though he judged that it would be the best thing to do. Does that make sense? Can you do other than what you judge to be the best thing to do? You might think that the answer to that question is obviously yes. I mean, lots of people judge that going to the gym would be best, but they never do it. Lots of people judge that giving up smoking would be the best, but they never Small. do it. But if you can do other than what you judge to be the best thing to do, then what does judging it to be the best mean? Surely judging something to be the best course of action means that that's the one you're going to go for. These are the puzzles surrounding weakness of will, which we'll define as doing other than what you judge to be best, and these puzzles are old. Plato said that weakness of will was actually impossible. If you judge an action to be the best, then that means you'll try to do it. And if you try and do something else, then you can't really have judged the first action to be the best. To sum that up in a pithy ancient Greek saying, Udeus hekon hamartene, nobody willingly does wrong. Like if you think that it would be best if you got up and go to the gym, but then you just stay in bed all day anyway, then you can't really have judged that going to the gym would be best, because if you really believe that, then you would have done it. Fast forward two and a half thousand years to one R. M. Hare, who more or less concurred with Plato. Hare thought that practical evaluative judgments, that is, statements of the form X is good or X is best, entailed prescriptions. They entail X should be done. He also thought that voluntary action expressed judgment. So if you voluntarily do something, you are expressing your judgment that it is the best thing to do. There is no such thing as weakness of will. But does that seem right? It still seems like you can do other than what you judge to be the best. Like if you were starting to become addicted to a drug and you decided, okay, it would be best if I stopped taking this now before it becomes a serious problem, you could still then take it anyway. It's still a voluntary action. Nobody's forced you and you're still responsible for it, but it was counter to your best judgment. Or what if you did something spiteful or vengeful? You think, oh, it's not a good thing to do. It would be bad if I did it, but I'm gonna do it anyway. Hare would probably come back and say that you didn't really judge taking the drug or taking revenge to be bad. Inside, you actually thought it was the best course of action and that's why you did it. Now, there is a difference between when we enact our values when we're living and surviving. So in certain circumstances, right, when you're surviving, you want to avoid giving in to sin, right, or evil. But in certain survival situations, you might find yourself doing things you would never do in a situation um, that is sort of privileged and you're living and everything's great. So again, give yourself a little bit of forgiveness and leeway for those situations. I think the most common example people use is lying. I think lying is wrong. And I 
don't lie outside of, you know, uh, survival situations. A survival situation where lying is acceptable would be something like a Nazi comes to your front door and asks you if you're hiding any Jews. And you, of course, would lie and say absolutely not because you don't want the people you're protecting to get killed. So that's a pretty common example we use on the internet to show us what we're willing to do when it comes down to it. But again, that's a circumstance that is about survival. That's an unorthodox situation. That is a horrible situation to be in. But in our normal everyday lives where we're going to our nine to five, why are we lying? Why are we why are we deceiving people? Now, I get it. If you're playing maybe a capitalism game, you might want to lie because your product needs to sell. I can understand if maybe you're a priest who wants to comfort a child, you might lie to them a little bit so they don't freak out about the heaven and hell, you know, dilemma they might be feel like might feel like they're facing. I know in life we come across these situations where it can feel like lying, killing, raping, doing horrible things are within reason. But if you want to challenge yourself to be more disciplined, if you want to challenge yourself to actually have values and and to keep to those values when times are tough, you have to ask yourself why. Why, if we're just evolved animals on this planet, would we even bother being ethical? I think it comes down to survival. And I think it comes down to ethics created through the construct of your perceived reality. Imagine, dear viewer, that a basketball team crushes its opponent by over 100 points. In the world we live in, the winning coach may get fired for such a display. Certain children's leagues refuse to even keep score, and participation trophies abound. Mediocrity is celebrated, applauded, and encouraged, while the celebration of excellence is frowned upon. But where does this desire for mediocrity come from? For Friedrich Nietzsche, the answer is simple, Christian morality. The Christian ethos and its call for piety, obedience, reciprocity, compassion, moderation, and equality, the Christian metaphor of a shepherd and his flock, all are symptoms of a weak form of morality. These beliefs stem from an inability to deal with the strengths of other people, of a need to be led. Strength, cunning, brilliance, exuberance and wealth, these are the things society ought to value, yet they are devalued. In his book, On the Genealogy of Morality, Nietzsche uses the example of lambs and birds of prey. Large birds carry lambs away to their death on a pretty regular basis. It would be understandable for the lambs to call birds evil, but to Nietzsche the terms good and evil don't make sense because the will to power complicates these concepts. The will to power is the drive to maintain control, power and success in life. Nietzsche famously asserted that this world is the will to power and nothing besides, and you yourselves are also this will to power and nothing besides. The world that we live in is one in which people, all life, compete to strive and even flourish. Each species has different instincts and strengths. Met tools use hard hats for protection. Tiger and lion bots eat tourists, and Iceman uses his cold, steely eyes to freeze his prey. The will to power isn't just biological. Every choice we make, all of the techniques that we use to live a happy and content life are all part of our will to power, of our desire to thrive in the world. If a tiger eats a tourist, that's good for the tiger, not the vacationer. For Nietzsche, the will to power is that part of us that annihilates moral considerations. From the beginning of time, the lions of the world have eaten the lambs. Though one may argue that's not how the world ought to be, that's just the way it is. Through the valorization of a single code, a universal morality that dictates what is good and evil, Christian morality keeps people in line. It renders people an undifferentiated mass that smothers the individual's will to power. It gives people a convenient excuse to be ordinary. Most of the time, people resist the urge to stand apart. They're afraid to be different, to be alone, and are more likely to assimilate. But Nietzsche thinks people should aspire to be exceptional. So specifically, when I talk about evolutionarily, 
There is something in our DNA that makes us want to survive. And so there's a type of weakness that's just disgusting. And it's a very specific kind of weakness. I think it's illustrated best in Laurel K. Hamilton's Anita Blake series, where Anita Blake is this person who protects her clan. But of course, when somebody comes and begs her for protection, their level of weakness or strength will impact the group. And she says to one of the men who come to her for protection, that if your weakness gets somebody else killed that I love, I'm going to kill you. Now, of course, this is a book that's fictional. It's about vampires and werewolves, and it's completely not within the realm of our reality. But it shares sort of that perspective of what do you do when someone comes to you for help, but their form of weakness brings you down. Specifically, I was thinking about this idea of preaching the right things. You can preach the right things every day. You can say, don't cheat on your wife, don't abuse your children. But if behind closed doors, you're cheating on your wife and abusing your children, then what you're saying really does matter less. Like you're giving good advice. That's some solid advice, my friend. But what does it matter if you yourself can't even be disciplined enough to follow it? What good is that advice when you're proving that it's unlivable, it's impossible? So if you have a person who's on this you know, journey of self-discovery, introspection, and they're trying to make a decision about what's good or bad. Discipline is a form of strength, right? It could be a form of weakness if it's overdone, but the worst type of weakness is one that I think drags people down with you. Now, this is not the same thing as being a burden. This is not the same thing, but I'll explain the differences, but really fast before I go to that, okay? There's a type of weakness that when you're preaching not to do certain things, but you're doing it, that sends the signal to everyone listening to you that it's impossible, it's hard. When we learn from people who have been there and done that, it is a lived, it's living proof that it's possible, right? So when you give into your weaknesses, you're giving into sort of the lack of survival that you should have in your brain. You're, you're not surviving. You know what I mean? And surviving doesn't mean just staying alive. Lots of people are alive. But what does it mean to live? And that I think comes from values. So you can be a consistent player in the game. One of the reasons Farm Brother and I allow, like he lets me watch his kids, is because my values are so consistent that he knows exactly my character. He knows I would never abuse his children or God forbid, you know, sell them to a foreigner or something crazy. He knows that I will lay my life down for my nieces and nephews before anything else. He knows if he died, I would take those kids in. He knows my my values. And because I'm consistent with my values, he can trust me. Now, if I was a weak person and I gave in to temptation and I didn't walk the walk, no way would he let me babysit his kids because now he can't trust me. My lack of consistency and conviction is a form of weakness, right? Weakness is not bad in terms of, oh, I'm too weak to carry this box. Can you help me? Weakness isn't even bad if you're mentally ill like I am and then you have to kind of rely on people to help you. Weakness isn't bad because you're reliant on people. It's bad because you drag people down with you. If you're a person whose weakness right, is hurting other people in a significant way, now you're not harm reducing. And harm reduction has got to be the focus or you're going to lose yourself to the temptation of the world. And if you follow, listen, if you're following any religion, any spiritual belief system, any sort of form of discipline, you know it's usually because it shows that discipline can lead to good. And discipline allows us not to give into temptation when the world so thrusts it in our face. Now, if you come from a religious bubble, you might hear that the world will tempt you with sin. But if you're a secularist, the world will tempt you with weakness, which is a form of sin, right? One of the best examples of this form of weakness would be Cain and Abel. Very classic story. Everybody knows it. Adam and Eve get kicked out of heaven. They have multiple children, including Cain and Abel. And Cain and Abel are rival brothers who have very different personalities. Cain is jealous and envious. He's a person who doesn't have a really a pure or wholehearted or heartwarming or wholesome kind of exterior interior. He's a person who's constantly in conflict with himself. He's envious and he's, you know, he's got this like attitude that's very grating almost, at least the way that I perceived it through the stories. Versus Abel is this 
pure and soft soul, the sort of lamb, if you will, somebody who's warm and caring and thoughtful and really isn't malicious. Well, Cain hits him over the head with a rock and kills him. Cain kills his own brother because he's envious of what he has. And now this is just a story. I don't take it as literal fact. I know a lot of Catholics and Christians do, but I'm a secularist now. So I'm going to take this more as a story. You tell your kids to learn about weakness. Cain was weak and instead of getting strong, took his weakness out on his brother. Did you shoot my cow? Yes. We're hunters. Oh, he's a hunter. I'm a, I'm a maker. Maker? I made this one cloth. What do you do? What does it look like? We're farmers. No, he's a farmer. I'm a herdsman. You're a suck is what you are. Somebody's upset because God looked on my sacrifice with favor. God looked upon my sacrifice with favor. <laughs> is he a total suck or what? Just gotta be so superior to everyone else. No, but get. superior to, to, than you. Hey, Five come on, hunters. Come on. Just relax and let's all just get some perspective. Oh! Yeah. <laughs> 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 What have I done? What have I done? Oh. 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 What have I done again? What have I done some more? Oh. Oh. What have I continued to do? He killed somebody because his form of weakness was so disgusting and deplorable that he cared not even for his own safety and sanity, but he didn't even care about anyone else's. This form of weakness is the worst kind I think we exhibit as human beings at different points in our life. Look, it happens. Sometimes life gets tough and, tough, and sometimes we are so weak that we do pull down people with us. That's okay. Stop now. Okay? Take your time, but stop right now. Stop pulling people down with you just because you're weak. Learn from your mistakes and get better. And discipline is absolutely a part of that process. You think you're disciplined? You better check your weakness meter, okay? You think you're disciplined? See how many of the people in your daily life complain to you about how you're impacting their sanity, their happiness, and their joy. You want to pretend that you're this big, amazing, perfect person? Fine. Be alone. But you can't because you're human and so you want to involve yourself in people's lives. You want companionship. You want friends. You want people to tell you you're a good person. Well, then walk the walk. This form of weakness is probably the most deplorable and disgusting because it literally harm amplifies instead of harm reduces. And that is just not okay. Now, it's okay in the sense that if we're all nihilists and nothing matters and we're just floating in space, sure, why not be cruel and torture people? But... If you want to live, if you want to be disciplined, if you want to find your joy, then you have to harm reduce. You have to be considerate and you have to be thoughtful. But that is a skill. And it's one that I am consistently working on because it does not come naturally to me as a biological creature. As a creature, I just want to survive. As a creature, I'm afraid I'm going to die. And as a creature, I'm afraid I'm going to lose control. But then I realize when I let it go to the universe and I remember that I'm just me, it's much easier to live. It's much easier to love. It's much easier to be kind. It's much easier to accept people for where they're at while encouraging them to be better. Discipline is a journey and it's personal. So don't freak out if it's not going perfect. But again, perfection was never at the point. If perfection was the point, we all would have failed. We all would have died because no one here is perfect. So don't seek out perfection. Just seek out practiced, consistent discipline. And again, everyone's going to have a different relationship with that discipline. I had uh, my last dinner with my priest friend the other night. So you guys know I'm moving and I'm doing this whole thing. And so I met him up. I met him up. I met him for a burger at our favorite joint. And we sat down. We, of course, were talking about philosophy and life and love and all these things. And he shared with me this amazing quote. He said, if you would like to know the measure of a man, note four things well, his friends, his enemies, his heroes, and his gods. His friends will tell you what he loves. His enemies will tell you what he stands for. His heroes will tell you his ideals and his gods will tell you what he holds sacred. This was really meaningful to me. And again, maybe I'm just so like formally Catholic that I just feel, yes, I love saint stories. I love these Bible stories. I love this good versus evil, this virtue versus sin. I love these dichotomies about existence and existing. I love them. So I read this quote and I'm thinking, okay, what do my friends tell me about myself? What do my enemies tell me about myself? Who are my heroes? And definitely who are my gods? You know what I mean? So this gave me something to reflect on. This gave me another challenge, another opportunity for discipline, another opportunity for joy. And I think that's what's missing in the world right now is this form of weakness where we bring down others is so a part of our narrative that we think it looks like strength. 
Think about the people who had one bad thing happen to them with X group, and then they go around preaching about how X group will harm you. That is not harm reducing. That is harm increasing. That is harm amplifying. You cannot go around the world expressing your pain and hurt as the reason other people should feel pain and hurt when interacting with X group. That is insane. That is so weak. And you see how they paint it as strength. Well, I got hurt by this group of people and I'm going to preach to other people so they don't get hurt without recognizing that you're one existent, like you're one circumstantial anecdotal situation. You're one, two, three, maybe even five situations are just a story about your life. They are not a reflection of everyone's interaction with X group. But the problem is, is we're so egotistical. We're so narcissistic because we're humans. I get it. That we think what happens to us will happen to other people. And I understand the road to hell is paved in good intentions. So you have all these good intentions about preaching strength to your groups, preaching strength to your audiences, preaching strength to your children, but it's really amplifying your form of weakness. So when you find yourself in a spiral, in a loop, and you don't feel like you have the confidence and strength you need, pay attention to see if you're amplifying your weaknesses. Don't be Cain, be able. That's kind of something. Be able. <laughs> but don't be Cain. Don't kill your brother with a rock because you're jealous. Don't envy what other people have. Be joyful for other people's joy. Be happy for other people's happiness. And then find your own. But that form of weakness that harm amplifies, not in 2023, girls. 2023 is going to be the denial of our weaknesses if it's bad. Again, being weak, being vulnerable, that is not the same as being cane weak. That form of weakness is very specific. Don't get distracted and do not lose hope that you yourself will not find strength. It's okay to have moments of temptation. It's okay to give in to our weaknesses on occasion. It happens, we're humans. But pick up the tool that the universe is trying to give you so you don't have to amplify harm in the future. And when you're ready to stop harming yourself and others, there's always a, a chance, like there's always an opportunity for change. The one thing that will frustrate me through 2023, especially, is if people come to me and say, oh my gosh, Brittany, I feel like you're talking about me. And I find out y'all are thinking I'm talking about you because you're eating a bag of chips on a Saturday when you shouldn't have. Girl, I'm not talking about you being weak. So you go get McDonald's. I'm talking about you being so weak that you neglect to feed your children. You're so weak, you cheat on your spouses. You're so weak, you spend every dollar in your bank account even though your kid needs lunch money. I'm not talking about people who are having a problem because they're eating too many bags of chips. Girl, your weakness is yours. You're only harming yourself, you know? I'm talking about people who are giving into their weaknesses, picking up the rock and killing their own brother because they don't wanna face themselves. Don't be Cain, be able. Thank you for watching. I hope you have a great day. I'll talk to you soon. Bye. In my head, in real life while I'm dead, my belly's being fed and I'm okay. I'm just fine, yet all I do is whine, not to you in my mind, cause I know I don't make sense. I've been nothing but blessed, so why's my life a mess? Please tell me, cause I'm sick of thinking yeah i'm sick of reaching out for the truth and living life is a fool